This is DW News live from Berlin. Tonight, the death toll from that bridge collapse in the U.S. now stands at six. Divers have recovered the data recorder from the cargo ship, which crashed into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. Now, a major U.S. port is out of action. Also coming up tonight, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu canceled talks in Washington when the U.S. decided not to veto a U.N. call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Are those talks now back on? And Thailand moves a step closer to allowing same-sex marriage. The lower house of parliament backing an equality bill. If approved by the Senate, Thailand would become the first Southeastern Asian nation to recognize same-sex unions. I'm Brent Goff. To our viewers watching on PBS in the United States and to all of you around the world, welcome. We begin tonight in the United States where federal safety officers have recovered the black box recorder from that cargo ship that knocked down a bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore. The Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed when it was rammed by a cargo vessel that lost control of its steering. Authorities will now examine the ship's data recorder. Divers are searching for the bodies of six people missing and presumed dead. Our correspondent Janelle Dumoulin is in Baltimore. She explained the latest on what is now a recovery mission. Yes, uh, Brent, that recovery operation is ongoing. Divers are searching the length of the bridge, uh, an area a little bit beyond that as well. But to be honest, it has been several hours since the recovery operation resumed this morning, and the status quo has pretty much remained the same. We heard a little bit already from Governor Westmore there what the challenges are like, what the conditions are like for the divers. But apart from the frigidity and the low visibility, also important to note that these divers, uh, they're facing strong currents, they're facing having to navigate around debris. And as you can tell behind me, the weather conditions aren't exactly right for this sort of thing. It is very rainy, it is very wet, it is very foggy. Now they are aided, of course, by equipment like remote operated vehicles fitted with sonar. They're also using sonar togged along, tugged along by boats. However, of course, this remains a very challenging operation, even as uh, officials say they will do everything they can to recover the vehicles, recover the mm. human remains, and uh, bring closure to the families who are affected by this terrible tragedy. We just don't know how long they will keep searching for. And we understand the investigation into this tragedy, how it, how it happened, what went on. That picked up speed today. What do we know? Exactly. You know, since this happened, of course, there have been a lot of wild rumors flying around from terrorism to cyber attacks. None of them grounded in evidence. Very important to stick to the facts here. As you mentioned earlier, the National Transport and Safety Board said that they had recovered the data recorder from the DALI and that they're hoping to be able to use the contents of that recorder to piece together a timeline of events. What exactly happened when and of course uh, they've also started interviewing the crew members of the Dali and eyewitnesses to the event. We're also hearing that the Singaporean counterpart of the NTSB will also be traveling here to conduct an independent investigation. But I also want to highlight something that uh, Transport Secretary Pete Buttigieg ju said just now in a briefing at the White House. He said that uh, a bridge uh, of this age it was, of course, built in the 1970s, uh, would never have withstood the impact of such a large vessel. So really what mm. we're looking at here is a tale, perhaps, of uh, older infrastructure colliding against modern commerce. And this is going to perhaps provide a moment of reckoning, especially given the role of uh, this uh, particular artery in logistics and commerce here. Our correspondent, Janelle. Dumoulin in Baltimore with the latest tonight. Janelle, thank you. And U.S. President Biden has pledged federal funding to pay for the reconstruction of the bridge. Insurers are also facing losses of up to $4 billion to cover the damage. The U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says that 8,000 jobs are now directly at risk 
Baltimore is one of America's major ports. It's not yet clear how long it will remain closed. The effect on maritime commerce is likely to be far-reaching. Fully loaded, the Dali is still stuck. Nobody knows how long it will take to free the vessel from the tons of steel that collapsed on it when the ship veered into one of the harbor bridge's main pillars. For now, the accident is causing major problems in and around the port. With the key bridge gone, a major artery along the U.S. eastern seaboard has been cut. Traffic will have to be rerouted for years to come, leading to clogged up streets in the greater Washington, D.C. area. But even worse, ship traffic in and out of port has also been stopped. The Port of Baltimore is one of the busiest in the United States, handling more than 52 million tons of foreign cargo last year, contributing some $80 billion to the country's foreign trade. With access to the port blocked, incoming vessels will have to reroute to nearby ports, including those in New York and New Jersey further north and Virginia a little further south. Among the goods handled in Baltimore, steel and cars. The port has major roll-on, roll-off facilities, and it's the entry point for hundreds of thousands of cars per year. German automakers even have their own facilities inside the sprawling area. While BMW and Volkswagen are located at Sparrows Point, just outside the main port, Mercedes operates out of Fairfield and won't be able to accept incoming vessels until further notice. U.S. President Biden pledged to oversee a quick and strong response to the incident and to ask the federal government for the funds needed to rebuild the bridge and port. The port of Baltimore is one of the nation's largest shipping hubs. It handles a record amount of cargo last year. It's also the top port in America for both imports and exports of automobiles and light trucks. Around 850,000 vehicles go through that port every single year. And we're going to get it up and running again as soon as possible. And local jobs are a concern in Baltimore, too. We're looking at not having ships coming in for no one knows how long at this point. You know, and that's going to affect the lives of, of longshoremen and stevedores and the tugboat crews um, that, you know, potentially they are lose, they're going to lose income because there's no, there's no vessel traffic coming in or out of the port. Bringing Baltimore back will take time. For now, the focus is on investigating what exactly happened on the Dali in the first place and how to make bridges more safe to avoid similar accidents in the future. Well, tonight, U.S. officials say that talks are underway to bring Israeli representatives to the United States to discuss military operations in Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reportedly requested that the talks be rescheduled. Israel was supposed to send a delegation to Washington this week to discuss its planned offensive in Rafa. However, Netanyahu canceled those talks on Monday after the U.S. declined to veto a U.N. call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Let's go now to journalist Sammy Sokol. He is in Jerusalem. Sammy, what are the reasons do we know behind Netanyahu changing his mind? Yeah, well, first of all, this uh, decision not to send the delegation uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, was supposed to create a leverage on the Americans and uh, maybe to pressure the American administration and to try and uh, cause them to veto uh, the uh, decision in the Security Council calling for a ceasefire. Well, this uh, clearly has failed. That tactic has failed. And Netanyahu was criticized not only by the media who has been uh, mocking him for this uh, decision, uh, but also uh, from within inside the government. Uh, ministers have been saying that this is was the wrong decision, uh, that the delegation should have gone to Washington, and that Israel is in no position uh, to put these kinds of uh, conditions uh, to the United States. So, Sammy, why do you think Netanyahu did this? I mean, why would he risk losing the support of the U.S., his most important ally? Well, recent uh, polls in Israel have indicated that the majority of the Israeli public do believe 
that Israeli leaders should follow the interests of the state of Israel and not the uh, orders, so to speak, uh, from the American allies. And this is especially uh, clear when it comes to uh, Netanyahu's uh, voting uh, group, the people that would be voting uh, for him or for the right-wing parties uh, in any upcoming elections. So this kind of confrontation with the United States, when Netanyahu is saying that he wants to go ahead and uh, launch a major operation in Rafah, and uh, confronting America on this is actually popular in uh, uh, wide circles in the Israeli uh, public and especially among his supporters. Yeah. So where does this leave relations between the U.S. and Israel? Yeah, well, the, the Americans are constantly trying to reassure the Israeli public uh, that uh, the uh, relations are ironclad that America will continue and support uh, Israel and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, but if we hear, uh, let's say, the uh, Vice President Kamala Harris in some of her comments and others, uh, we hear the uh, implied uh, threat that if Israel will uh, continue uh, to challenge the, the Americans, if it will not comply with these kinds of requests, uh, such as avoiding a ground operation, a massive operation in Rafah, not letting in food uh, into the Gaza Strip and so forth, that there will be consequences. Uh, so uh, we have to see uh, when, at, at what point, the Americans will actually uh, decide to go ahead with that. Journalist Sammy Sokol with the latest tonight from Jerusalem. Sammy, as always, thank you. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories says there are reasonable grounds to believe that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. Francesca Abanizi says the Israeli military has intentionally subverted its protection functions in the operation against Hamas. She added that Israel's position is no longer acceptable since the UN Security Council on Monday called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Albanese cited international law to make her case. Take a listen. After five months of monitoring and analyzing Israel's onslaught on Gaza, my report finds that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating um, that Israel is committing the crime of genocide against the Palestinians as a group in Gaza has been met. Specifically, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with a requisite intent, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Well, let's get more now on this from Michael Link. He's a former UN Special Rapporteur on Occupied Palestinian Territories. He's an Associate Professor of Law at Western University in London, Ontario, in Canada. Professor, it's good to have you on the program. You know, we just heard the current UN Special Rapporteur, the person who has the job that you used to have, they are saying that a threshold for acts of genocide has been met. What do you make of this? Look, in, in uh, international law, there is uh, there are two um, treaties and conventions which deal with the issue of genocide, the 1948 Genocide Convention and the 1998 Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court. And they coincide with respect to what the definition of genocide is. It's very specific uh, among international lawyers. Uh, and I've gone through uh, Ms. Albanese's report several times. She's very careful to be able to use uh, the legal definition with respect to you showing genocidal acts as well as showing genocidal intent. And her report, I think, is uh, um, has a number of facts with respect to genocidal uh, actions, um, including the high death rate, uh, the trauma that, that's been experienced by the Palestinian population, the destruction of um, civilian uh, homes, universities, schools, hospitals, um, and the... Um, and the destruction of all the infrastructure with respect to the distribution of food and uh, and water. She's also talked about the genocidal intent, and here she's mm -hmm. quoted a number 
of uh, Israeli uh, political and military leaders indicating uh, an intent either to declare all of the population of, uh, of Gaza uh, to be guilty with respect to the crimes of October 7th um, and professor or uh, stating, no, let me just finish, okay. or stating that uh, they're going to cut off food and water to, uh, to Gaza. Uh, you know, her name is on this report. Help us understand how this, port, how this report is put together, given the fact that she is banned from entering Israel and she does not have access to Gaza. Sure. Um, her report was put together in the same way my reports are put together, because I didn't have access to Israel or the occupied Palestinian territory either. Um, uh, one of the good things with respect to this particular human rights conflict uh, in, uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory is one of the best documented human rights conflicts in the entire world. There are a number of high quality international, Israeli and Palestinian organizations that collect um, information and publish them in highly reputable reports. As well, there's a fair amount of reporting, particularly over the last five and a half months uh, with respect to actions that are going on in Gaza. So uh, in this age of you like instant information, it's a lot easier to be able to gather and assemble uh, responsible uh, facts and, uh, and evidence and put them together to see if they match a legal test for war crimes uh, or, uh, or genocide. I'm sure you're aware that um, Ms. Abadizi has been accused by Israel um, for being biased and even anti-Israel. As someone who, who had this job earlier, what can you tell us about neutrality of this independent UN body and its role within the UN? Sure. Neutrality is an important feature. It's a, it's a requirement for uh, special rapporteurs and independent ex, uh, human rights experts, as well as for UN staff. But let's let's unpack that a little bit. I, I think what we look at in the modern age is what we called informed neutrality uh, or informed impartiality, uh, where our starting basis isn't pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. Uh, it's uh, pro-human rights law in this case and pro-international -human humanitarian law. What you're using is the well-developed structure that the world has developed over the last 75 years in international law, particularly on human rights and humanitarian law. And you apply that to uh, uh, Israel and Palestine, and particularly Israel's occupation of Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. Um, and basically, the, the path I trod and the path I think that Ms. Albanese is mm -hmm. trotting uh, is, uh, uh, is full of reports and facts that preceded us uh, mm -hmm. that wind up matching uh, violations of war crimes, violations, in fact, now of, uh, of genocide. Um, the Special Rapporteur has also called for an arms embargo and sanctions against Israel. What sort of status do these reports have under international law? Well, they're what we probably call soft law. You know, hard law would be an order coming from a court that you're bound to uh, have to obey because there's an army and a police to back up that court. We don't have that, in for, uh, alas, in international law. Uh, when when rules are made or judgments come down, say, from the International Court of Justice, um, it really then goes to the United Nations, and particularly the United Nations Security Council, to, try to want to enforce uh, these provisions. And we've already seen the um, resolution that was adopted by the Security Council on Monday calling mm -hmm. for an immediate ceasefire over the month of Ramadan uh, not being obeyed. We haven't seen the release of the hostages by Hamas, as was called for in the resolution, right. and we haven't seen the stopping of uh, of bombardment by, uh, by Israel. Professor Michael Link, a former UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories, we appreciate your time and your analysis tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's take a look now at some of the other stories that are making headlines around the globe this hour. Ukrainian officials say a Russian attack on the city of Kharkiv has killed at least one person and wounded several others. The Interior Ministry reported that Russian airstrikes hit at least three residential buildings and a school. The city's mayor says that a medical facility was also damaged. In Thailand, the parliament has passed a marriage equality bill bringing same-sex unions closer to reality. The bill needs to be approved by the Senate and the king to become law. If so, Thailand will become the third country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. Europe's biggest economy is feeling not too cheerful these days. Economists believe that Germany is close to stagnation. They expect the economy 
to grow by just 0.1% this year, down from an earlier forecast of more than 1%. High interest rates, weak global demand, and political uncertainty have dashed hopes for a stronger recovery. Well, Karsten Reschke joins me now from Frankfurt. He is the chief economist at ING Germany. It's good to have you with us. I'll ask you what we've been asking other economists today. Um, what is wrong with the German economy? Well, you mentioned already. So Germany is facing the same cyclical headwinds as all European economies in, in the sense of uncertainty, geopolitical uncertainty, um, but also higher interest rates, high inflation. But then there's, there's the homemade problems that Germany is also facing. And that is, if you summarize them, a loss in international competitiveness over the last 10, 15 years on the back of too little investments in infrastructure, digitalization, education, and all these things come together now and, and keep the German economy in stagnation. And take us from, from the boardroom to the living room here. How will a stagnant, a flat economy, how is it going to affect the average everyday German? Well, um, currently it's not because we, we still have extremely strong labor markets. We do have record low unemployment numbers. We have record high employment numbers. And we don't have any experience in Germany over the last decades with a stagnating economy over a longer period. How it could affect people in the living room is, is clearly that there will become more uncertainty on the labor market, mm -hmm. that job security will, will become more important again, that some people will... Um, lose their jobs on the back of structural transitions, that we could see more industry moving away out of Germany. That would also mm. cost jobs and well-paid jobs. So this is how it could reach the, uh, the living rooms. And if we're going to have to basically write off 2024, is there a reason for hope for improvement in 2025? Do you see signs? Oh, it is far too early, to be honest. Um, there, there's always hope. Um, we, we, we should see a little bit more structural reforms, a bit more policy initiatives out of Berlin that would help. Um, I wonder whether we're really going to get them. What could help in 2025 is lower interest rates on the back of rate cuts by the European Central Bank. Hopefully a more favorable global um, economic environment that should also help boosting exports uh, out of Germany to, to the rest of the world. Um, and we should also see a stabilization of the, uh, the real estate market, which should also kind of push up the German economy again. But when you look at the structural weakness, I don't think that we're going to have um, solved the structural weaknesses by 2025. We will see growth returning, but it will only be meager growth even in 2025. Are, are you looking to Berlin, to political Berlin, for any help to turn things around in the near term? It's the, of course, the, the natural reflex of an economist always calling for the government to help. Uh, when we look, I think we've seen good initiatives, but the magnitude has been far, far too, too small. Um, and, and given what is currently happening in Berlin, that this coalition, you know, is in, in, in a lot of controversies. I don't expect too much breakthroughs coming out of Berlin. I'm a bit afraid um, that we will have to see, like also in the early 2000s, when Germany was already the sick man of Europe, yes. that um, reform changes will have to come from the corporate world as well. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard of that label many times recently, for sure. Carson Brzezewski, Chief Economist at ING Germany. We appreciate your time tonight and your analysis. Thank you. Well, Thailand's lower house of parliament has approved a marriage equality bill. If ratified in the Senate, Thailand will become the first nation in Southeast Asia to recognize same-sex marriages. The landmark bill has been more than a decade in the making. 400 members of the House of Representatives gave their approval, with just 10 voting against. The committee that drafted it said lawmakers were making history in Thailand and transforming the lives of LGBTQ people. For those who have been waiting for same-sex marriage, we only have one step left, which is to be approved by the Senate. Then you will have the right to register to be married, the rights you have been denied in the past. 
Today, we, the majority of members of parliament, have voted to approve it. In the future, the words men and women and husband and wife are to be replaced by words equivalent to persons and spouses in the country's legal code. Thailand has long been seen as a haven for LGBTQ people from all over the world. The amendments will give same-sex couples access to the legal, financial and medical rights of their heterosexual counterparts. Thailand is finally going to be accepted and recognized as a true paradise for LGBTQI people. Because very soon we will recognize equal marriage. In the capital, Bangkok, many residents welcomed the development. I'm pleased that marriage equality legislation has passed in the lower house. I hope it will be implemented because it will likely benefit many people. Many people around me are LGBTQ. Everyone wants this bill to pass because they want to be able to marry, just like everyone else. The bill now goes to the Senate, which rarely rejects legislation passed by the lower house. Then it's on to Thailand's king for royal endorsement. If approved, Thailand will become the third country in Asia after Taiwan and Nepal, and the first in Southeast Asia to allow marriage for all. Oh, here's a reminder now of our top stories. U.S. investigators have boarded a ship that crashed into a bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore. Authorities will now examine the vessel's data recorder. Divers are searching for the bodies of six people missing and presumed dead. And talks are underway to bring Israeli representatives to the U.S. to discuss military operations in Gaza. Netanyahu canceled a planned meeting when the Biden administration on Monday did not veto a U.N. call for a ceasefire in Gaza. You're watching DW News live from Berlin. After a short break, I'll be back to take you through the day. Stick around. We will be right back.